Good afternoon and welcome to uh, our second session of Mycoclinics run from the University of Exeter MRC Centre for Medical Mycology. Um, these, uh, today's session, we're going to be talking to you uh, about COVID-19 associated fungal infections. And our speakers are Joost Wouters, who is going to be talking on COVID-19 associated pulmonary aspergillosis, or CAPA, and Ritu Aurora, who will talk to us about management of COVID-19 associated mucormycosis. Um, my name is Tihana Bichanich uh, from uh, St. George's University of London, and my co-chair will be Arnaldo Colombo from Brazil. Just to let you know, this is our second mycoclinics, and this, these are quarterly meetings, um, which have been set up. This is our second meeting. The first one was in September. Some of you may have watched. And these are the upcoming dates, and uh, you will be sent email reminders of titles and registrations in due course. So please do look out for these. Just in terms of the purpose of MycoClinics, some of you may be familiar with MycoTalks, which has been a series running for over a year now, which focuses on science and uh, translational uh, talks from a range of clinical academics and basic scientists. But MycoClinics was set up specifically to share clinical expertise through cases, uh, whereby two clinical experts during each session each present a case study with diagnostic considerations, thinking through the management process, treatment challenges and deliberations, follow-up and outcomes. Um, some of them may also ask you in an interactive way to ask some questions, and then they will also present a broad literature overview afterwards. The duration of each of the talks is half an hour, and we will save the questions for both speakers until the end. And these need to be submitted through not the chat function, but a separate Q&A function, which won't be visible to the audience, but will be seen by us, the chairs, and fed um, at the end of the talk to the speakers. And also to note that recordings of all of the talks, including past talks, are available on the MRC CMM YouTube channel. So, Without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Joost Wouters, our, our first speaker, who is from the University of Leuven in Belgium. Uh, Joost has a background, very interestingly, a mul multidisciplinary background, having first obtained his degree in civil engineering in 1995, followed by a degree in medicine in 2002, at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. He then trained in, in internal medicine, specializing in 2008, followed by emergency medicine in 2010, and finally intensive care medicine 2011, which he currently practices. He also, in terms of his research background, has a PhD degree um, in biomedical sciences, and he works at the medical intensive care unit of the University Hospital of Leuven. And his research activities include severe infections and antimicrobial pharmacokinetics in critically ill patients. And he has been an associate professor at the Faculty of Medicine at Leuven since 2013. And then when it comes to today's topic, COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillosis, uh, Joost has an extensive clinical research profile, including both um, epidemiological studies across the Dutch-Belgian network, as well as interventional studies, including the recently published POSA flu study. Um, there are also other planned studies on inhaled antifungals, and his centre also um, undertakes studies of a disease pathophysiology and mechanism, um, including the use of animal models, um, including zebrafish. So Joost is going to present today a clinical case of CAPA and a discussion. Thank you, Joost. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tihana, uh, for this uh, nice introduction. And also, thank you very much for the possibility to uh, present here this uh, clinical case. Um, so uh, let's start uh, with uh, this case. So it's about uh, a 65 year old uh, male uh, with uh, diabetes uh, as a medical history uh, and a BMI of about 40. Um, further on, there is uh, arterial hypertension and uh, this patient is also taking prednisone uh, 20 milligrams a day uh, since one year for myasthenia gravis. And so normally this is a disease, uh, especially present in uh, women, uh, second, third, fourth decade, but uh, in men, it can happen also later on in the sixth or seventh decade. This patient has been vaccinated uh, against uh, COVID uh, months ago. And now he presented in the emergency department with a classical history, a classical story of uh, uh, respiratory disease uh, with five days of fever, dry cough, and progressive uh, dyspnea with a need of oxygen of five liters. Um, the nasal swap uh, was a PCR positive uh, for uh, SARS CoV 2. Uh, this is the chest x-ray at the time of uh, admission to the emergency department and um, what uh, if what concerning the lab uh, results uh, there is uh, moderate inflammation high dimers uh, lymphopenia um, increased ferritin uh, and uh, for the rest was a normal organ function um, the antibodies at least anti s uh, were positive in uh, that patient um, so, uh, um, according to the, the, the guidelines, uh, this patient, besides uh, receiving oxygen, which was uh, increased towards high flow nasal cannula with 60% of oxygen, the patient receives methylprednisolone, 40 milligrams a day, uh, which is more or less equivalent to the six milligram of dexamethasone. Um, empirically, ceftriaxone has been started um, once a day, two grams. Uh, sputum culture has been taken, which um, eventually was negative by day three. At that time, ceftriaxone uh, was also stopped. And then uh, also low molecular weight heparins um, have been uh, started in a sort of of intermediate dose, let's say, uh, which is intermediate between prophylactic and uh, therapeutic, um, and um, the level is followed by the anti uh, 10A. But then uh, the patient um, who was in ICU of one day after uh, the emergency department deteriorated by day four uh, respiratory deterioration with the need for intubation, mechanical ventilation, and proning. And so maybe just a question, um, what do you think, uh, uh, what's going on here, uh, or what are some possibilities uh, of this deterioration at day four? So. Um, uh, the people from uh, Exeter developed this uh, nice poll, so maybe you can uh, uh, vote at this moment if it's possible. Um, you can see some possibilities here. Uh, I don't know whether we can see the results of the poll. Um... People are still making choices. Uh, so maybe give it a minute. Okay. These are all uh, classical possibilities. And so the, the list is not, is really um, uh, a real life list, let's say. So, um, and of course, um, a combination of possibilities is also a possibility, let's say. Yeah, so we do see that uh, some people um, think about bacterial superinfection. Uh, I think this this is possible uh, in in comparison with uh, flu, for instance, with severe severe influenza. We do see, and that has already been published several times in large uh, cohorts, that uh, bacterial superinfection is uh, also later on in the disease. So let's say not uh, at the moment of ICU, uh, ICU admission, uh, which is uh, the case in, in 40, 50% of the persons in severe flu, while in COVID, we do see more like an isolated uh, viral pneumonia, let's say. 
of course, pulmonary embolism is also um, very important to, to think of and to exclude. This patient, for one or another reason, has not received a, seat, a chest CT at, on ICU admission, um, and, and, and he receives these low molecular weights, but uh, again, uh, pulmonary embolism may occur um, in this situation, as we know. Uh, of course, there is the naturally clinical uh, evolution of the uh, COVID pneumonia, which uh, can deteriorate indeed. Um, what we saw several times is that patients uh, being OptiFlow for a few days, um, they they had a normal oxygen saturation, arterial saturation, but they, they were in respiratory distress uh, um, and um, it can be subtle, and um, these patients do have uh, high transpulmonary pressures, uh, leading to what is called a patient self-inflicted uh, lung injury, PSILI. Um, and that can lead uh, on further on to pneumothorax or uh, pneumomediastinum. And that also can be a reason for uh, respiratory deterioration. Of course, there is atelectasis and sputum impaction. And then, yes, indeed, um, uh, around, um, uh, I, I will talk later on, of course, but uh, patients can do a fungal superinfection, especially with uh, aspergillus. Um, so I think this is more or less a, a list of possibilities, and that's also the way we are working in our ICU. Um, so, okay, let's uh, move on. Um, the game plan, yeah, okay. Um, at that moment, uh, ICU day four, of course, we will again check uh, and do some cultures, uh, and important uh, also uh, to do bronchoscopy at that time. In the beginning, when the patient has been admitted to the emergency department, um, the uh, the safety and the feasibility for the patient uh, to do bronchoscopy at that time was estimated by the treating physicians to be not possible uh, because they don't want the patient to, 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 to get on the ventilator due to the bronchoscopy, but now the patient is intubated and uh, a bronchoscopy can be done in safe circumstances uh, together with uh, a BL, so bronchoalveolar lavage. In the beginning, the first wave, COVID wave, there was some doubt on the safety of doing bronchoscopy in severe COVID patients in ICU, but now, nowadays, uh, and e even very fast uh, within the first wave, it was clear that um, the precautions could be taken to do safe bronchoscopy. And so I really uh, would like to advise all of you to put the threshold to do bronchoscopy in this situation very, very low and go for a bronchoscopy with BL. We will see later on why it's important. And of course, we need to think about escalating our uh, antimicrobial therapy in pre uh, So at that time, we did uh, take uh, a CT, a chest a CT. So I can only, uh, I, I should only show you a few slices going uh, from left to right. We go from up to down in the thorax and you do see bilateral infiltrates, not that much uh, um, round glass opacities, but really um, uh, uh, infiltrates, uh, subplural infiltrates also um, with um, both sides, as you can see, and also uh, upper and lower. So um, large, um, large um, the infiltrates at both sides with an increased CRP, um, uh, no lung embolism and uh, hemocultures and uh, other cultures taken at that time uh, eventually became negative. But then on bronchoscopy, which was done there uh, at that time also, we, we saw this image, which is an image uh, of uh, the trachea and the, 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 the bronchi uh, right and left. And you do see these white placas. And um, uh, two days later, uh, Aspergillus fumigatus has been cultured, but uh, really from uh, one day after doing the bronchoscopy, the BL uh, galactomanan uh, was 5.2, which is uh, sky high. And uh, even the serum galactomanan was positive uh, 1.2, which is uh, not often the case in severe COVID patients. But in this case, it was. Uh, we really like to take biopsies, but um, knowing that the patient has been taken uh, or is taking low molecular weight heparins, there was no biopsy performed, and um, we started voriconazole. Uh, you can also start isovuconazole, uh, both with uh, therapeutic drug monitoring according to the, um, to the ITSA guidelines. 
So uh, this case, uh, if I comment, can comment a little bit more on this case and, and uh, giving you an overview of the literature, uh, we know that uh, there is a wide range of incidents of uh, kappa um, going from a few percentages, 4% up to more than 30%. And if you look closely to all these uh, studies, uh, you will see that um, the, the, the range of awareness or the level of awareness, the, the, the definitions, the case definitions used or the local diagnostic strategies of doing bronchoscopy, of doing galactomelan, uh, give rise to this uh, wide range of incidences. And it's important to, uh, to uh, know also that this disease has a tracheobronchial form like we just saw and also a parenchymal uh, flow, uh, form. Um, our colleagues, Dimopoulos, uh, has reviewed a lot of studies, um, ending up with an incidence of about 8.6%, uh, accumulating 2,000 383 patients and they all had or proven or probable or putative uh, kappa in uh, these uh, ventilated patients. Um, we also published a study uh, as you can see here recently uh, in CMI uh, about 600 uh, ICU patients um, in 20 centers in nine countries uh, um, in, the, in the period between March 2020 and May 2020. One and there we ended up with a slightly higher uh, incidence, about 15% proven and probables using the ECMM uh, consensus criteria. And also important to know that this uh, co-infection was there uh, by the end of the first week, beginning of the second week after ICU admission. So also a clear difference with uh, influenza-associated aspergillosis, uh, which has been shown to be a quite early or very early uh, superinfection um, within the first day after ICU admission. Looking for clinical risk factors in a multivariate analysis, okay, but besides age and, and respiratory support, um, Tocilizumab also came out as uh, an independent risk factor for kappa. In this study, in our study, corticosteroids did not come out, but of course, most of the patients took corticosteroids, so it was not like uh, half of the patients taking corticosteroids and half not, so that was a little bit uh, difficult to show. Um, anyway, we could show that uh, kappa was independently associated with a 90-day mortality, as you can see here. It's more or less a, a double of mortality. Very recently, uh, we also uh, again reviewed the literature because uh, a lot of studies uh, do come um, uh, our way, and uh, we collected data uh, from six thousand, uh, about six thousand two hundred patients. And as you can see, uh, depending on whether the studies are retrospective versus uh, prospective observational studies, the incidence range between seven and fifteen percent. Um, looking again into the risk factors, you can see that uh, in, in, in several studies, corticosteroids indeed came out as an independent risk factor for kappa, and especially this uh, study uh, was interesting, showing that the combination of and corticosteroids and tocilizumab is an uh, independent risk factor for uh, developing uh, COVID-associated pulmon associated pulmonary aspergillosis. Um, of course, um, here in this case, in this specific uh, situation, the patient is taking corticosteroids even before ICU admission uh, for many months uh, in a dose which is not really the ERTC uh, dose. Uh, the ERTC dose uh, is uh, more than 0.3 milligrams per kilograms a day for more than 21 days. This patient was there for 0.80 milligram per kilogram birth, but for many, many months. So here uh, there is an additional risk factor, let's say, um, and it's important to, to see that this uh, makes or may have made difference in this, uh, in this specific case. In general, of course, to diagnose uh, invasive, uh, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, we always need to look for the combination of a clinical problem, which is clearly the case here, respiratory deterioration by day four, in combination with some mycological evidence and in combination also with uh, imaging evidence. Uh, and as you remember the CT here, uh, the CT did not show these typical hematological uh, signs of uh, aspergillosis like uh, um, halo sign and cavities. Eh? But we know in general in ICU that invasive aspergillosis in ICU 
on a chest CT is uh, you can only find these typical CT images in less than 30% of the patients. And so the CT we saw here is uh, really compatible or possibly compatible with uh, aspergillosis. Um, of course, uh, the, the diagnosis is still difficult um, uh, due to several reasons. Uh, first of all, um, our mycological tools are not very good in uh, discriminating between colonization and tissue invasion. Um, angio invasion is more easy to detect because then normally your serum galactomanan is positive, which was the case here. But um, in most of the cases, the uh, galactomanan in the BL is positive with a, with a positive culture with a negative serum uh, galactomanan. Other things that are uh, a little bit problematic, uh, if we think uh, um, like 20 years ago, aspergillus in ICU was the same as uh, um, that being that now. Um, you do see patients that uh, survive, luckily they survive uh, kappa or uh, aspergillosis with antifungals, but sometimes we all, all also have the impression that there are some light forms of aspergillosis uh, or lighter forms that uh, even may be uh, cleared by uh, the own uh, immune system of the patients. Uh, there is, by the way, a discrepancy between the probable uh, kappa diagnosis, the pre-mortem kappa and, and the autopsy. Um, People from Pittsburgh published uh, a large series of uh, autopsies that they collected from all over the world, and there the proven, the incidence of proven uh, kappa was only 1.5%. In combination with the initial reluctance to perform bronchoscopy, and you can see that there are some uh, uh, problems with the diagnosis of kappa. Anyway, in this case, uh, I think the diagnosis is clear. And based on the published evidence and based on uh, um, uh, some meetings with a large group of international experts, uh, we recently published uh, in intensive care medicine under the suspicion of Paul Verwey, uh, this sort of uh, clinical guidance for the uh, management uh, of uh, kappa. And so as you can see here, uh, it starts by a sort of clinical deterioration or also a refractory severe uh, respiratory uh, illness, uh, severe COVID in ICU. And then uh, we do take into account uh, clinical factors that may increase the probability of kappa. In this case, uh, as you know, the patient was also uh, ERTC positive, let's say. And then uh, there is the important uh, place of the bronchoscopy in the diagnostic workup, not only because you can take samples and you can do a BL with uh, culture, galactomanan, PCR if you want, but you can also inspect the large airways macroscopically. And if you do see these plaques, as we saw here, um, Okay, taking a biopsy is an advantage, but not always possible. And if you combine these plaques with the culture, your uh, your um, your diagnosis is uh, a very probable. Let's say. Um, of course, if you do not see these plaques and you do have uh, one or more, and I will go uh, on uh, later uh, a few slides further on, but if you do see uh, mycological arguments, one or a combination of microscopic, uh, my, uh, mycological arguments, you can also um, make the diagnosis of uh, kappa. A point is also that depending on the country or where or the region where you live, uh, you need to take into account azole resistance. Um, and of course, this will influence your antifungal therapy. Um, so um, coming back to these criteria um, uh, to make the diagnosis of kappa, I show you here the, the ECMM guidelines, and I uh, will try to focus uh, on this part because this is the proven aspergillosis, which is let's say uh, uh, seldom but easy. Uh, and I will not talk about possible uh, aspergillosis. And you do see here the combination of microbiological evidence, imaging, and clinical factors. And if we go through this list, you will see that um, you can have or a BL culture um, with um, aspergillus, or a serum galactomnan more than 0.5, or a serum galactomnan more than 1, or um, two PCRs in serum, uh, or a bell PCR, or the combination of a serum and a bell, or a combination of several of these factors. And from my uh, personal uh, bedside experience, and until now, we did see about 500 uh, severe ICU patients uh, with COVID in our uh, uh, university hospital here in Belgium. Uh, I can say that uh, uh, on top of this, we try to go for 
two consecutive bronchoscopies uh, in these patients, uh, especially when uh, the galactomonanium BL is uh, around 1, 1.2, 1.5. Uh, we also have some doubt and we go for a second bronchoscopy, uh, knowing that it's feasible, if it's feasible and safe for the patient, of course, um, to make the diagnosis uh, more um, harder. Um, Importantly, uh, where uh, we we can uh, we can use this galactomonanium BLL with a, a short turnaround time in our hospital, but there is also uh, there are also these point of care tests uh, that, um, for instance, here we validated that Juan Mercier did that uh, for 100 about 1 in 80 ICU patients uh, at a time with a very good uh, area under the curve. So you can also use these uh, quick point of care tests as a first to have a first ID on the galactomanan in BL. What about serum galactomanan and also serum beta diglucan? Um, this is a nice study of uh, the group of Paul Verbey, and uh, this study shows, in fact, that uh, serum galactomanan and serum beta diglucan is not a good tool for screening, but is, is a very good tool to have an ID on the severity and the invasiveness once you uh, made the diagnosis of kappa. So here, if you make the diagnosis of kappa and uh, in combination your serum galactomanan is more than 0.5 or your beta duplicant is more than 80 in on top of your diagnosis you know that uh, the, there is more invasiveness and there is more severity and this was also the case in our uh, clinical case that we are presenting here um okay um so going back to the uh, case report uh, we uh, summarized it here um there is also the issue of corticosteroids because um that's an that's a difficult uh, issue and it was the case already with flu eh? um, you remember patients with severe flu uh, entering icu could also develop uh, aspergillosis uh, uh, with flu we do not use uh, systematically uh, corticosteroids not at all eh? but some flu patients and this is also the case for severe COVID, they can uh, use corticosteroids before ICU admission, as was the case here. And then for severe COVID, standard of care guidelines, uh, 10 days of corticosteroids. Um, so uh, we are very um, aware that the, the patients with severe COVID can develop aspergillosis uh, around day eight, around day 10. So our threshold, once again, to do bronchoscopy is very low. Um, imagine that this patient was exactly the same, uh, except that the patient was not taking corticosteroids. Um, okay, there you need to be aware of the complication of kappa, as I said, by the end of week one or week two. In this special case, where the patient was already taking prednisolone for many, many months, uh, you need to be aware that kappa can be there, which as it was the case here around ICU admission. Um, what about prophylaxis? Um, is there any evidence for uh, antifungal prophylaxis in uh, severe COVID? Uh, this is a very small study, uh, which is not at all a, uh, an interventional study, not controlled study. It was just an observation in uh, uh, one of our uh, neighboring hospitals in Antwerp, and Niels van Regenmortel. Um, he uh, observed that uh, in a sort of before-after observation, that after introducing antifungal uh, inhaled antifungal by with a nebulized ambisome three times a week, he did see a, a, a reduction in the incidence of kappa from 61% to 9%. So be aware that this is a very selected uh, biased population, but it gives an idea that uh, antifungal prophylaxis can reduce the incidence. Um, there is another study by our colleague Martin Hunigel, um, who uh, looked into a cohort of about 130 patients, 75 of them received receiving antifungal prophylaxis uh, uh, under the form of IV posaconazole and 57 receiving no antifungal prophylaxis. And what you see here is that, um, and by, by the way, the overall incidence of kappa was 7.6% uh, by the end of the first week after ICU admission. And as you can see here, um, the incidence uh, was decreased from about 15% uh, um, uh, towards 1%. Um, 
in outcome, in survival, there was no difference in this observational study. Um, as far as I know, there is another uh, clinical trial going on in the United States on the use of isofucanazole in the prevention of kappa, uh, but this study is still recruiting, is still going on. Uh, last slide on the difference between uh, COVID-associated and influenza-associated aspergillosis. Um, so as you can see here, uh, um, about 15% of the patients might develop COVID-associated aspergillosis uh, between three and nine days after ICU admission. Corticosteroids and uh, tocilizumab uh, will play a role there. Uh, there is less uh, angioinvasion in comparison with severe flu, uh, mortality uh, doubles uh, in both cases. And uh, if you look to severe flu, you can see that uh, earlier on, uh, there is a, a, a high, slightly higher percentage of invasive uh, pulmonary aspergillosis. In flu, we already know that about 20 to 25% of the YAPA cases are uh, tracheobronchitis. These numbers are not yet clear for COVID-associated aspergillosis, but uh, in my uh, opinion, they are slightly lower uh, than in um, uh, flu-associated aspergillosis. Um, and uh, so here uh, with this slide, I would like to end and say to you, be aware of the, uh, in, the, the diagnosis or the, the existence of uh, kappa in uh, about 10% of your critical ill COVID patients occurring median eight days after ICU admission. Um, please perform bronchoscopy if possible uh, and try to use a strict criteria for diagnosis. Importantly, in the like now in Belgium, we are in the fourth wave of COVID. There is a clear shift from um, uh, non-vaccinated people, as it was the case in the first wave, uh, towards uh, one third of non-vaccinated patients, one third of older vaccination patients, but also one third of ERTC positive, fully vaccinated patients like solid organ transplants, active hematology or uh, oncology patients without having antibodies, although they were fully vaccinated. So this population will probably be a population where antifungal prophylaxis will be needed. And to, and to end, I would like uh, to thank all of you for your attention, but especially all the nurses uh, uh, working daily and uh, during day and night 24-7 in our ICU units, and they work in very difficult circumstances, as you know, to treat all these patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joost, for that really excellent case and great overview and fantastic research work that you and your research group have been doing to contribute to the literature on this. And at the same time, whilst managing these patients on busy ICUs. So thank you. Um, I, I, as we said at the beginning, if we could, I see there's one question in the Q&A so far, but uh, please post more questions for Joost in the Q&A. And in the meantime, I'm going to just go and introduce um, our second speaker uh, from New Delhi in India, Dr. Ritu Arora, who is an ophthalmologist. What a treat to have an intensivist and an ophthalmologist discussing these clinical mycology cases today. So the topic of, of Dr. Arora's COVID-associated mucomycosis and we're very privileged in that she's been right at the heart of um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in the second wave in India, she tells us, as Dean of Molana Azad Medical College in New Delhi. Um, and she's a director of um, an eye center and she's got an extensive experience and membership, including of the National Academy of eye sciences and, um, and as well as having a WHO fellowship in cornea and keratorefractive surgery, which is indeed her subspecialty as an ophthalmologist. She spent time training clinically and doing research both at the University of Toronto, um, as well as uh, Portland, Oregon, and has over a hundred publications in peer reviewed journals, including quite recently, I note on PubMed, a single center experience of man, uh, cases of COVID-19 associated mucomycosis, which is going to tell us about today. 
She uh, received an award, an achievement award from the American Academy of Ophthalmologists in 2010. And she's been principal investigator in 12 national and international trials. So it's, it's a real treat and thank you very much for joining given the time difference as well. Um, and uh, Ritu is going to tell us about e-management, particularly of sino-orbital uh, mucomycosis in the context of COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you for this nice introduction which you gave me. And it's a privilege to be associated with this group. Though I am not an ophthalmoplastic surgeon, but uh, I managed, I was a team of the group which managed the whole scenario of COVID associated mucomycosis, which we got in India and especially New Delhi. And uh, the time period which I'm sharing is during the COVID time, second wave of COVID time, especially from end April, when we started having deluge of uh, mucomycosis cases. So we, we had the opportunity to study, manage. It was a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, we as ophthalmologists joined in with primarily the caregivers were from uh, ENT department associated with neurosurgeons, radiologists, microbiologists, pathologists. So it was a complete teamwork. And uh, we kind of collaborated the whole research. So going over how um, we had the mucomycosis cases, uh, I would, instead of running you through a single case, I will run you through group of cases because they had different kinds of manifestations. The roots of spread of uh, mucomycosis are primarily that they come from the pterygopalatine fossa, which is the main reservoir for mucomycosis. And the fungus, which is ubiquitous, is proliferates primarily in the nasal cavity and the muca reaches the pterygopalatine fossa. And from there, it enters the orbit through the inferior orbital fissure, or there also occurs a retrograde spread coming from the nasolacrimal duct. It also can come in from the ethmoidal sinuses. This is another picture to show that this is after the excentration of the globe, the medial wall of the orbit, which this you can see the whole crust of the muca over there. So since the fungus is there in the nasal cavity and it proliferates in the sinuses, so it can enter the orbit through this route. And this is another uh, slide to show the retrograde spread from the nasolacrimal duct, lamina papricia of the medial orbit, and it could also be a vascular embolus, which is the non-contiguous way of uh, transmission. The, when we had the sudden deluge of cases, the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology came up with the warning signs and symptoms of rhino orbital cerebral mucomycosis. They may present with nasal stuffiness, foul smell, epistaxis, nasal discharge, nasal mucosa erythema, or there may be some discoloration. There, is a, there might be a regional pain in the orbit, paranasal sinuses or the dental pain. Not uncommon that some of our patients started primarily with the dental pain and even the dentist had, they had a tooth extraction and the mucomycosis was missed. They may have a facial pain, worsening headache, proptosis, sudden loss of vision, facial paresthesias, sudden ptosis, drooping of the upper eyelid because the third nerve involvement with in muco, facial palsy, ocular motility restriction and double vision, fever, altered sensorium. So these were the warning signs put forth in our Indian Journal of Somology. And further, the similar signs have already been delineated by other studies too. Of course, not to mention, not to forget the infraorbital anesthesia and the pupillary abnormalities. 
So with that in the background, I will run you through the cases. This is the case one who presented to us primarily with proptosis, that is the eye was tending to come out. Along with it, there was ptosis. There is drooping of the upper lid. And if I were to run you through the video of this, you can see that there is the ocular motility is limited. You know, you can see that the left globe is moving, but the right globe is not moving. So there was involvement of the third nerve. And if we really look at the pupillary signs, there is present an afferent pupillary defect. The patient had good vision though, vision was 612, while on our CT scan, we could actually see that all the sinuses, there was an infiltration in the sinuses and there is present in the medial wall of the orbit. And in the apical area, you can see the arrow being there, there is present uh, infiltration coming into the orbit area. We will discuss the management later in a comprehensive form. The, I'll just run you to the next case. This is another case who presented to us with diminution of vision, just diminution of vision. And we could actually see the branch retinal arterial block in this patient. This is the third patient who presented to us with the severe ptosis. I mean, complete, this eye could not be opened. And there is present proptosis with forward bulging of the eye. There was congestion here. This patient was primarily diabetic and we could not see the fundus of this patient, which was, which was hemorrhage was there. While this patient came during the COVID time, we did the CT and we could see that the medial rectus, the medial rectus was highly thickened, enlarged, and there was present deposit in the extracolon and infiltrating into the intracolon compartment. There was present, this is, there was present for this patient had undergone a debridement by this time. This is another patient who presented to us. You can see that patient has seventh nerve palsy. She's not able to close her eye. And uh, when, while we are make, tell, trying to tell her to clench her teeth and there is present on the fundus area, there is complete central retinal artery occlusion. Patient had no vision in the right eye. And there was present in the medial orbit, you know, in the orbit and in the ethmoid sinuses, there is definitely present an infiltration, which is also going on to the orbit apex. So there was a varied kind of a symptoms, which I will take you down later. This is another patient who presented to us with, again, proptosis. There is present severe chemosis, you know, it's like bulging. And this eye was just not moving. You can see that the eye is being lifted just to show the underlying features. And there is present on the MRI, the similar kind of features. The fundus, we couldn't even take these patients to the fundus um, for the fundus photography. This photograph has been taken through the indirect ophthalmoscope. And we could see a cherry red spot and there is extreme whitening of the retina and there is present a central rat retinal artery occlusion. So this patient presented with, you can say, nutshell, poor vision, no vision, ophthalmoplegia, there is proptosis. This, he underwent, uh, he underwent a sinus debridement. And after that, you can see that there's some bit of the movement has started recovering and I can be going up. So this is the varied presentation we had in our patients. This patient, when he underwent an Doppler for the eye, in the central retinal artery, the blood flow was zero. This is another patient who had had a liver transplant earlier and was an immunosuppressive, presented with crust, crust on the face area and completely inability to open the right eye. There was total ptosis and proptosis and she was jaundiced. We have taken this video to show that patient has pupillary abnormality. There is present uh, afferent pupillary defect. Some of the patients were sick and the others had presented to us during the COVID time. I will discuss with you that we had actually seen the patients who had COVID report not more than 
12 weeks before they were positive, while few were COVID positive at the time of presentation. And this is another patient who had presented with very severe, very severe edema, periocular iridema, and there is present, you can see completely mutilated eye. You know, there was absolutely, the globe was perforated due to the fungal invasion. You know, we see, you can see that the it's eye is right being lifted to show and we're trying to elicit any ocular moment but there was no ocular moment but this patient was sick he ultimately succumbed to the mucor it was not mucor actually we later found out that this was aspergillus so when we had so many patients coming in we pres we we published our first report because this was a very early report of a rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis during covid second wave in 2021 from a it was a preliminary report of the patients coming over three weeks. The, we took the report data from second week of May, third week of May, 15th of May to 5th of June, the data was collected. Within that much time, we had 60 cases of probable COVID associated rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis. The primarily the presenting features were ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, inability to move the eye, periocular tenderness and edema, proptosis, black discoloration of the eyelids, facial palsy, endophthalmitis, retinal artery occlusion, disc edema, and disc pallor. And we did this study to see the clinical epidemiological profile of the possible risk factors. The commonest thing which we found in all these patients, 59 out of 60 patients had diabetes as the commonest, and they had HbA1c, which was more than, which was like, which was in the range of 10.31 plus minus 2.59 percent, and uh, so 59 patients were diabetic. We somehow, in because the number of patients was 60, we somehow would not see any correlation with the use of systemic steroids at that time. Maybe the number of patients was low and steroids were given to these patients in different form. Some had taken methylprednisolone, some had taken dexamethasone, some were on prednisolone, varied doses. And also not to forget that some of the patients had not taken any steroids and had presented to us. And so we had concluded in the study which we published that SARS-CoV-2 variant with accompanying glycemic dysregulation was the triggering factor for the epidemic of COVID-associated rhino-orbital cerebral mucormycosis. This is the other, I mean, we just compiled these photographs and the characteristic finding here was the infarct in the retina because of the angio invasion, especially to the ophthalmic artery, the blood flow to the central retinal artery and the eye was affected and leading on to no vision. Some of the patient had presented to us with this kind of a picture when globe was cut perforated due to angio invasion. And uh, of course, these are some pictures I've already shown you. The, all the patients, they underwent diagnostic nasal endoscopy first. And first there was a cytology taken and in some, wherever there was crusting, we also took the histopathology from there. The crusting showed typically microbiologically on the KOH broad aseptic high fever present. On lactophenol blue, we could see the aseptic high fee and sporangium was noted in all these patients. Mm, on the periodic SS shift stain, we could again show these broad aseptic high fee and with right angle blanching. Similar feature was also shown in the silver methylamine stain. So number of them were positive, which I will discuss later that how many came positive while how many were probable. So even when we had probable, we did start these patients on intravenous amphotericin B, which was again a challenge because we were facing a shortage of amphotericin B at that time. And the radiological features of these patients on the CAT scan showed, I mean, they had you know mix and match of these findings. The hair we can see in the medial orbit, the, there is a thickening of the medial rectus 
with a lot of deposition of the um, uh, mucor material over there and only in the orbital apex. This is another patient who had undergone uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery, a debridmo, and still has some residual disease lying in the medial rectus compartment. These are the ocular signs and the presentations which we had in our patients with uh, who presented with mucor. But this is a report only of three weeks. And then finally, the American, we published, uh, of course, I was one of the co-authors, the primary author being from the otolaryngology department. So since it was a multidisciplinary, so there were a number of authors over there. So they compiled the total number of cases which had come. And so there were 131 patients report by that time and of which 111 patients had prior history of SARS-CoV-2. And rather some were presented with the COVID-2, they were uh, positive at the time of presentation, while there were few who had no history at all of being COVID-2 positive. I mean, in a way that they were never tested. And steroids were received as part of the treatment by most of these patients. And among the COVID-2 patients, 131 patients, 124 recovered. So against whatever is given in the literature, we found that the mortality of these patients was lesser than what has been reported in the literature. And uh, uh, of course, six died. And it was concluded that ROCM upspurge was seen in the context of COVID-19 in India. And of course, in this study, when we did the correlation, a significant correlation with systemic steroid use was also found. It was with primarily factor was COVID-2 itself leads to immune dysregulation leading on to prone to these kind of uh, opportunistic infections. There was uncontrolled diabetes, dysfunctional immune system and injudicious use of corticosteroids. Uh, overall, when I took the pictures from there, they also had these kind of lesions like there is present of cause hair ptosis, there is a crusting there, there is a gingival lesions. These are the features when they had the maxillectomy was done for them. There was present gingival lesion and there is a palatile ulceration. Uh, on diagnostic nasal endoscopy, you can see the crust, which is there in the middle turbinator. There was a mucopus formation and there was another black crust on the lateral nasal wall. And the histopathology of all these lesions showed the similar results. Mm, and this is how it was documented that it was the mucor present there. And then these patients also had their MRIs done and it showed the extent of the lesion. Uh, when, we, when we published our study, we just reported because it was just a short study and a rapid communication. So all the patients were treated with IV amphotericin B liposomal, which was given five milligram per kg after testing their kidney functions, and uh, which, which were also monitored. And the IV amphotericin B was continued at least for 14 days. We had a challenge of procuring liposomal amphotericin B at that time. So some of the patients also received colloidal lipoid complex of amphotericin B. Functional endoscopic sinus surgery was performed. Some patients, it was combined with maxillectomy and orbital excentration to reduce the disease load. Also, to supplement the treatment, some of the patients received transcutaneous retrobulbar amphotericin B. One ml was given, which is 3.5 mg per ml for three days, was given in six eyes to limit the disease. And this is the final management which was presented by 131 of 131 patients. Medical management included the use of injection of liposomal amphotericin B, posaconazole, and voriconazole was given only when six patients had aspergillus positive in these invasive sinusitis. And surgical intervention included endoscopic approaches, open approach and combined approach, which my colleagues from the otolaryngology department did. The various surgeries were functional endoscopic sinus surgery, maxillectomies and endoscopic orbital clearance and open excentration. That is where my ophthalmic colleagues came in. And every attempt was made to completely debride, debride the death tissue and reduce the fungal load. 
regular suction and clearance was done and intracinus amphotericin B irrigation to the tune of 5 mg per ml was done while the debridema was done. Because of the aggressive management, I feel that we could control the disease and the mortality was low. Patients were discharged from the ward once there was no evidence of the disease endoscopically with improved clinical features. And then they were followed up on oral posogonazole at least for one month for with diagnostic nasal endoscopy. This is the, uh, the this article which we have published in American Journal of Otolaryngology talks about the antifungal therapy used. Amphotericin B was used in 106 patients who were COVID positive and uh, COVID negative patients 20 and voriconazole was used in these number of patients. And uh, surgery was used with just FES, orbital excentration and open maxillectomy. The final outcome, we had 94% patients who recovered while 5% deteriorated and of course died eventually. If you may ask what is the role of retrobulbar amphotericin B, 3.5 milligram amphotericin B deoxycholate with aggressive, it is debridement and intravenous amphotericin B, it has to be used in conjunction with intravenous amphotericin B per se using the retrobulbar amphotericin B does not have much role. Uh, as per the study published in American Journal 2021 by other authors, this is before the COVID, they talked about that this helped in lower risk of exentration, but similar risk of mortality. If you were to ask what are the indications for orbital exentration, that is removal of the whole eye and all the devitalized tissue from the orbit, muscles and everything from the orbit, it is when we have diffuse orbital involvement, unilateral lesion, no useful vision, minimal extension or no extension to cavernous sinus, and worsening of orbital component or no improvement in 72 hours of functional endoscopic sinus surgery. The algorithm followed was first, they had a diagnostic nasal endoscopy and then into start of intravenous amphotericin B associated with radiological investigation and FES. And if after that there was deterioration, these patients underwent orbital excentration. After this, we tried to study as to what was the reason for central retinal artery occlusion, which we clinically saw. Uh, to a surprise, what we, we had expected that angioinfasion in the central retinal artery. And we did a study on 10 patients of uh, COVID-associated rhinoorbital mucomycosis. And in the 10 patients who were PL negative, that is light perception negative, we found that on histopathology, there was present orbital fat necrosis, fungal high fever seen, and primarily involving the ophthalmic artery in 10 specimen. The central retinal artery was, however, patent. So since the disease had evolved all the way back to ophthalmic artery, so that goes to show the importance on the use of proper dosage of intravenous uh, amphotericin B. We had concluded that uh, because that was the time when, when we were in a dilemma, whether we should remove the globe or not remove the globe because we thought in some patients, the vision loss could be just simple optic nerve pressure. We concluded that the acute vision loss in mucomycosis was associated with orbital apex involvement and thrombotic ischemia of the ophthalmic artery. Cessation of flow of central retinal artery was occurring secondary to ophthalmic artery thrombosis. This article had just been accepted in ophthalmic plastic and reconstructive surgery. These are some of the reports which we're trying to show patient presenting with ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, and when we did the color Doppler, there was no flow seen in, in the central retinal artery, but ophthalmic artery could be visualized in the, this is the left eye, the ophthalmic artery could be seen. And this is the fundus, since the right eye had no vision, this patient was taken for excentration, and this is where we could show the presence of fungus within the artery. And these are the other patients which uh, we, are, we, can, we are showing the histopathology of the exenterated globes along with the, uh, along with the enhanced, contrast enhanced magneto, magnetic resonance imaging, which was done in some patients. And we could see that here, if you really look at it, there is no artery which can be seen on the other side. 
while here the enhancement is seen. So it's the it's it's combined approach of MRI contrast enhanced with color Doppler, which helped us to manage these patients well. So we, I would like to re-emphasize the role of contrast enhanced MRI. It assesses the extent of infection and presence of devascularized tissue. It suggests the infection of vital tissues. Loss of contrast enhancement leads to devascular tissue, which would benefit from the Bridmo. So that it guided us that how much more we have to go in in the management of the Bridmo. This is just, um, again, this is taken from Indian General Ophthalmology. By that time, they had come up with an algorithm in the management approach, approaches for possible, probable, or proven cases of rhino orbital cerebral mucomycosis. In cases where CNS involvement was there, these cases were managed with neurosurgeon, and the management was orbital excentration with aggressive debris more peronasal sinuses, with, up till the extent of the margins was clear. Amphotericin B dose used was within five to, of course, we used only five milligram, but this was what was recommended at that time. And uh, this isavuclozole is not easily available in our continent. So we didn't use this. We did use patients oral posaconazole 300 milligram twice a day, at least for one month. You know, Again, the cost being the major factor. So with a combination mix and match of all this, we could manage all the cases which we had of mucomycosis. So thank you. The role of ophthalmologists you may ask in this multidisciplinary approach is because more than 50% of cases come with ocular involvement. We identify the patients where their early debridement is likely to save vision, surgery planning, subtotal excentration so that we can get better cosmetic outcome. Currently, my plastic team is in uh, working out to how to rehabilitate these patients. Monitoring the course of the disease after intervention and prevention of exposure keratitis and its sequelae. So thank you very much. And I very much acknowledge the role of my co-workers who helped me in managing and presenting this, this talk. Thank you very much. Any questions, I would be happy to take them. Thank you okay. very, very much, Ritu, for that really fascinating um, uh, talk and series of clinical and radiological pathological images. And, and great that the videos worked as well. So thank you, real insight for those of us who are uh, work in other specialties. Um, we, we're just going to um, move on to, I see we do have some questions coming up in, in the Q&A. So I'm just going to hand over to my co-chair, Arnaldo Colombo from Sao Paulo in Brazil to just uh, field some of the uh, Q&A. Thank you, Tijana. It's a great pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to see the outstanding presentations we saw. Uh, I will start with some questions we received to Just Walters. Uh, let's start with the diagnosis. Uh, it, it's not uncommon that patients with severe COVID-19 remain several weeks in the ICU and they will experiment several periods of clinical deterioration. They can have systemic inflammation, they have bacterial infection, they can have fungal infection. Then we have some questions here from the audience uh, asking you to, to chat a little bit more in detail. How do we screen those patients? What is the role of biomarkers? Uh, you, you request bronchoscopy, but for several centers, medical centers in the world, it's not that easy to perform the first bronchoscopy. Uh, and as I mentioned, patients will remain several weeks in the ICU. Uh, are you going to request bronchoscopy every week? Then uh, those is the, 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 the questions we have from Adelia. Uh, the place of BDG in the flow diagram uh, and the same, uh, we have some questions in regard to uh, how you can uh, handle tracheal secretion or non-bronchoscopic-driven -bron uh, non BAL 
uh, samples. Thank you, Just. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I tried to write down some questions uh, and I will try to recapitulate. Um, so first of all, um, to you have to make a distinction between patients who are in ICU and who are intubated versus those who are not intubated. And uh, of course, those patients who are not intubated, it's not easy. Uh, and in most cases, it's impossible to do bronchoscopy in these patients because they are most of the time on high flows and high flow nasal cannula with a high uh, oxygen amount. And indeed, um, uh, we do not do bronchoscopy in these uh, patients. Uh, you have to know that about 30% of the patients uh, in the severe COVID patients on ICU are on high flow nasal cannula and about 70% uh, are uh, intubated. Um, of course, these patients who are on high flow nasal cannula during ICU admission, they may deteriorate um, after a few days or after one week, uh, ending up um, with intubation. Um, and uh, the median duration of ICU stay in, in our ICU is, uh, in general, it's about 10 days median. But for those patients who are intubated, intubated it is like 16, 17 days median uh, day of ICU stay. So eventually most of the patients um, also those who deteriorate from high flow nasal cannula and get intubated there at that time you can do bronchoscopy and as we know in EOTC negative patients uh, um, aspergillosis will not happen will probably not happen in the first week uh, so if they deteriorate later on um, and they are intubated then I think you still need to go for bronchoscopy not only to capture fungal co-infection but also to capture um, uh, bacterial co infection and have a, a bacteria uh, to downscale your antibiotic empiric antibiotic therapy um, other markers uh, in serum it's very difficult to screen because most patients they do have positive markers positive culture positive galactomenon in a, a bl or in a lower tract respiratory samples in the serum most of them are negative so beta beta diglucan and galactomonan in serum is not a good screening marker. It's a pity we, there is an urgent need for uh, better markers. And um, I know that there are some studies on the way uh, combining several markers like in serum, like uh, galactomonan, PCR, beta diglucan, and trying by combining to a higher up uh, sensitivity. But in general, uh, you will not uh, find uh, a lot of positive uh, serum samples. Um, maybe in the future, we need to go to, to look for an immune signature. Instead of going for the fungus, we need to go for the immune signature. But this is uh, research. This is not yet uh, established. So uh, it's, it is a problem that we cannot screen well in the blood. But on the other side, 70% or more of the patients are intubated and there we can do bronchoscopy. We do not do it to do every week. We, we do it when there is deterioration, a sort of second hit, a sort of third hit, or when your patient is uh, in a sort of refractory um, uh, stable, uh, severe situation, uh, not making progress under your corticosteroids and under your antibiotics. At that time, I think you need to look for um, uh, uh, samples, bronchial samples. And also, um, uh, I, my, uh, in my opinion, it's less safe to go to, go to a CT with an ICU patient uh, who is intubated or even an ICU patient who is on ECMO. It's less safe uh, to go to CT than to do a, a bronchoscopy. So I think um, this is more or less, or uh, at least part, uh, partly answer on these questions. Uh, concerning the timing of the bronchoscopy, um, if you have an EOTC positive patient entering your ICU with severe COVID, then I would also advise to do bronchoscopy from the beginning, as we saw in this case, in this clinical case here. Uh, while if you have an EOTC negative patient, um, we know that most of the patients will only, uh, if they have a fungal super infection, they will do it by the end of the first week, beginning of the second week, and then do your bronchoscopy at that time. There is another issue, which is the interference with the corticosteroids, because, uh, okay, we 
all of us do give corticosteroids for 10 days, six milligrams of dexamethasone or 40 milligrams of methylprednisolone. But as you know, these patients are there in your ICU for several weeks. And what we do see is that if they develop a second hit or a third hit, um, um, in, in, in a lot of patients, we do not find any bacteria or any fungus. And at that time, we again will restart corticosteroids later on uh, in, the, in the disease, in the second week, the third week. And so then it's also important to know that there is no uh, bacterial or fungal superinfection while you start corticosteroids. Because imagine that you just start cort more corticosteroids uh, later on in your ICU stay and you do not check for bacterial fungal co-infection. I think this is not the good way of working. Perfect. Then we have a second group of questions related to therapy. You mentioned TDM. Uh, then let's talk. Let's ask you about first TDM and voriconazole. Uh, and once you, you have a patient that's not in the target level, how easy is to achieve the target level? Uh, and second, uh, if understood correct, you suggested to do TDM also for isavoconazole. Is, is that your suggestion? Yeah, so if we look to the ITSA guidelines, uh, first choice is voriconazole uh, or isoviconazole, uh, 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 according to the ITSA guidelines. Uh, in our center, first choice is still voriconazole in combination with TDM. Even if, even if this is an ICU patient, even if this is an ECMO patient. So we do start voriconazole six milligrams a day, two times a day for the first day. And then from the second day on, we give four milligrams, uh, four milligrams per kilogram, two times a day. And then around day four, we go for the first uh, sample. So a trough sample of voriconazole and we check whether the exposure is okay. Uh, if uh, at that time the exposure is not okay, we, okay, we try to, uh, higher up the dose uh, if, if, if it's possible in terms of um, complications or contraindications. Uh, and then we again check it uh, like three or four days later. Um, at that time, uh, if it's still not okay, uh, then we switch to, um, to another product, Conozole or uh, even Ambizone. If in the beginning um, there is a contraindication for azoles, um, like severe liver dysfunction, or if we already know that uh, there is azole resistance from previous samples, or if you live in a region with high azole resistance, then you might uh, consider to start uh, um, uh, ambisome from the beginning. Um, and then, of course, yeah, in our country, isoviconazole is not reimbursed from the start, so uh, we cannot uh, use it from the start. But uh, I, I see that more and more we, we switch uh, towards isoviconazole if we cannot reach our targets with uh, voriconazole. Uh, by the way, uh, the number of um, side effects uh, with isoviconazole is lower uh, uh, in comparison with uh, voriconazole. Um, uh, there is, for instance, the QTC uh, time um, with azoles, uh, it's, it's a problem. With isoviconazole, it will lower your QTC time uh, as, as one of the azoles. So first choice, voriconazole with TDM. Uh, and last question for you before moving to mucormycosis. What about time of, the, of therapy? Uh, what are the major drivers, you know, to, to make you treat a period or four weeks or six weeks or, or a larger period. Yeah, so you mean the duration of the therapy? Duration of therapy. Okay, um, so um, when the patient will be discharged from ICU to the normal ward, um, uh, we try to do a, a, a CT scan and uh, you will see that in a lot of these patients, you do not see any more these uh, plural uh, nodules or these uh, infiltrates. So if there is nothing to see on the CT, uh, this is an, uh, an, um, an additional argument to stop therapy. Uh, and in general, most of the, um, the, the duration of the therapy or we stop by ICU discharge or uh, shot after ICU, uh, shortly after ICU discharge. So um, we, do not, we do not give it for uh, six to 12 weeks, uh, like it is in the guidelines for neutropenic patients. 
Um, we cannot really follow uh, a serum galactamnan since that is not positive in the beginning. That's also different uh, um, uh, in comparison with hematology patients. Following up the galactamnan in the BL yeah, is practically not feasible. So we do not do uh, repeat, galacto, uh, repeat bronchoscopies. If the patient is going well, then we do not repeat bronchoscopy. So it's very difficult um, to, to have clear markers uh, to, to steer your therapy. So in conclusion, um, um, shortly after ICU admission, uh, we stop uh, this therapy. Um, and for sure, if there is no more, if there are no more lesions on CT, uh, uh, then we have an additional argument to stop um, uh, therapy. So for our patients, like I said, median duration of intubated patients is 16 to 70 days. So they will receive um, uh, ASOLs uh, for about three weeks, let's say. Thank you so much. Uh, just congratulations for all the work you, are, you have done in nurse specialist ICU. Thank you. We now are going to move to Dr. Ritu Arora. Uh, we have some questions in regard to mucormycosis. The first one is, could you please uh, go back and share with us in more detail uh, indications of local applications of AMFOB in, in patients with eye uh, involvement? That's the uh, first when question. When patients had presented to us with the local, you know, with this eye involvement in a sense that it was definitely starting from nose it was nasal, sinus, and then orbital. Now, we did give retrobulba. That's what, if I see local, that's what maybe they mean. So we did give retrobulba amphotericin B in some patients. But uh, we are in the process of, uh, you know, we're now analyzing our data that uh, how those patients did. But uh, overall, my understanding was that if they were given only retrobulbar amphotericin B, it will not work. They need to have systemic amphotericin B for sure uh, to limit the disease. Thank you. And uh, uh, in plus uh, local and other form, which my ENT colleagues did when they were doing the debridmo from the sinuses, they did irrigate the nasal area and the orbital area with the amphotericin B, 5 mg per ml. Yeah, tell me. Perfect. And could you uh, repeat the percentage of patients with eye involvement that uh, really require orbital exenteration? Uh, See, we also is... devised, as we went along the disease, we were not very sure uh, when we have to do the exenteration. So it's only, and plus we were facing a massive challenge in procurement of amphotericin B. You know, suddenly we needed a lot of that. But in the beginning, yes, so we found that when it was a sightless eye and uh, not responding to our antifungal therapy, uh, and we did go on for uh, exenteration. But that was in the beginning. But after, uh, when we had formalized our treatment regimen and patients were getting proper dose of amphotericin B, diabetes was getting controlled and they were responding to the treatment, the exenterations were far less after that. Perfect. And then there is a, another question here to you, Dr. Arora. Uh, regarding to the species distribution of mucor and if you were able or not to correlate specific genus uh, of the mucoralis with some uh, uh, difference in terms of natural history of the disease, were you able to connect this etiology? I have to check that with my microbiology colleagues, you know, because we manage the cases overall and from ophthalmology point of view. Uh, I'm sorry, I won't be able to answer, but I'll check it with my my okay, and, and considering the large number of patients you had, were you able uh, to check for fungal biomarkers in this collection? It was actually and not needed. You... you know, it was not because they were coming. They were just showing so many positive on lactophenol blue and all. You know, the positivity yeah. rate was very high. Again, okay. I, again, I have to check with my microbiology team for the fungal yeah. biomarkers, but they never mentioned about it. 
because the idea is to use this setting of patient to validate strategies that could be useful for other settings where the diagnosis is not that easy as you, you get it. But I understand that you, you need to check the data. Uh, yeah. Tihana, do you would you like to, to add some questions for? Yes, I mean, there's actually been a question popped in by Joost Walters, which actually is very, it has parallels with something I was thinking of asking. Um, we know that in India, you do have a, a relatively high incidence um, pre-COVID of rhino orbital cerebral mucor. So, would you? I was curious, and clearly Yost was as well. How does the incidence of mucor in this population group? You said largely diabetics. Obviously, in the case of COVID, there was also a lot of concomitant steroid use, and you mentioned the contribution of the local immune dysregulation from the COVID itself. But how does it compare pre and post? Can you just tell us? And that's a good question. That's a very good question. Yeah. And also the physiology of it. Was it more severe? Was it different in any way? Yeah, see, we were getting pre-COVID mucormycosis, but not in so much of numbers. Not in so much of number. In a year, I mean, if in my practice, you know, or I would come across maybe four to five patients in my big hospital, you know, so the presentation by and large is the same in a sense they usually have diabetes or they have underlying malignancy and they present with the same kind of features but it's very less that was a major difference uh, you know here we had like you can see just patients coming and coming so within like two months we had 131 patients in the COVID time compared to pre-COVID we don't see so many patients of mucormycosis. Maybe they are more than what are reported from the world literature, but not still so many. Otherwise, the presentation is by and large the same. And in your view, it's mainly steroids, or you mentioned you had a quarter of patients who didn't receive steroids. So yes. to what no, extent? We thought earlier, we thought earlier the steroids are the culprit, but when we really went down to analysis, we found that... Uh, the more clue was going more towards diabetes because COVID also leads to diabetes, you know. So some patients had newly onset diabetes. Some patients had worsening of the pre-existing diabetes, you know. So that's the reason their uh, HbA1c's were very high. I mean, that is one factor which we saw in all the patients. Steroids, yes, in the later study, they could find a correlation. Because uh, the way they were managed, it was not uniform. Like even COVID was not managed uniformly in all the setups in India. You know, some patients are getting steroids, some are not getting steroids, some are on inhalation steroids, some are getting dexamethasone, doses were different. So there was a wide variation in the use of steroids. But uh, in the second study, which was compiled of 131 patients, they found the correlation with the use of high dose of systemic steroids. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Arora, one question for you. Patients with COVID-19, uh, it's a, they experiment a severe inflammatory phenomena and they remain with metabolic dysregulation for a long period. Uh, the question is, for how long a diabetic patient who developed COVID remains under risk for developing mucormycosis? What is the yeah. percentage of late presentation of mucor in your court? I would say that about 70% of the patients, when they presented to us, they were COVID negative. They were COVID negative. They had had COVID, say, within last three months. That's all the report which we had. But not many patients at the time of presentation were COVID positive. So that's why uh, we feel that COVID itself leads to some immune dysregulation. So that makes them more prone. And they have high levels of CRP, ferritin, D-dimers, you know, so those biomarkers which you're saying which makes them more prone to these kind of infections. And, and going back to the time of treatment that you, you mentioned, you mentioned 
uh, a short period of treatment of posaconazole, if I'm not wrong, like four weeks, six first weeks. First, they were see prosoconazole was not the only treatment. For first okay. fourteen days, for first fourteen days, they had been managed with intravenous empotericin B. That was uniform for all the patients. Then it means that most of your patients were treated no more than two months or yes. less than two months. Yes. Definitely. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Because availability of the drug and the cost of the drug, you know. And, and by that time, the ENT colleagues, when they were following and doing diagnostic nasal endoscopy, they had found that they had become negative. I mean, they were not finding any crusting. If they were finding any crusting, the treatment was continued for longer period. But uh, even this played a role. But yes, average, if I have to say, the antifungal went on for two months. There is another question for you in the Q&A, um, Dr. Aurora, from Andy Borman from Bristol in the UK. Um, he's saying that hematology patients with similar presentation, they sometimes advise packing of post-operative cavities with amphotericin B-soaked gauze or pastes to include amphotericin B rather than irrigation to try to increase contact time. Do you have any experience of the, this in, in your center? No, I don't have any experience, but that's a good idea. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Is somebody from our mycology reference lab here in, in England. Okay. Yes. Yes, I agree that packing done, then there is a longer, uh, you know, availability of empotericin B. But I felt that the bottom line was use of systemic empotericin B. The bottom line was that. That was what saved all the patients, liposomal empotericin. And there are some groups suggesting very high dose of liposomal amphobe. Uh, did you uh, feel that, uh, is there any uh, situation where you could, uh, you See, should when go- When we were going on to the higher doses, higher doses, a lot of them, they developed the renal dysfunctions their kidney parameters were getting deranged. So we managed them with maximum highest dose was five milligram per kg body weight, liposomal empotericin. Perfect, super. I yes. guess we are, Kihana, would you like to close the session or? Yeah, absolutely. We've got three minutes left. Um, I, I'm just, you know, reflecting here on the parallels, you know, the, listening to these cases just made me think, and I would have loved to have asked both speakers to comment more, but just the parallels between the two conditions where you've got, if you like, a local respiratory mucosa that's invaded and inflamed by, you know, a virus on a background of, a, 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 if you like, immunocompromised hosts, either through hyperglycemia with concomitant often or almost always steroid exposure, allowing for, certainly in the case of mucor, some really quite invasive presentations. But in the case of aspergillus, maybe a whole spectrum of disease as, as elegantly illustrated. And clearly there are still remaining diagnostic challenges and uh, a gap in the evidence base, but I think We've had a really um, wonderful overview from the two speakers of these two conditions, um, uh, which have been, you know, from really first-hand experience. I don't know if either of you has any last comments or points to make, either Joost or Ritu, before we close. I just want to thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to be able to be part of this seminar. Thank you. Yeah, from my part, also, thank you very much uh, for having this uh, possibility. Maybe one remark, I think uh, an important issue for the future will be uh, the um, uh, really search in the immune response in severe flu or severe COVID and uh, try to see whether we can uh, modulate the immune response uh, towards less severe flu or less severe COVID while in the meantime uh, preventing these uh, super infections. I think in the future we need to do research in that, uh, in that region. Uh, so that's my last uh, advice. Not the sledgehammer approach of, of just steroids, something a little bit more subtle. Yes.
Okay, well, on that note, I'd like to thank once again, Joost Walters and Rita Aurora for excellent presentations, as well as my co-chair, Arnaldo Colombo, and also the um, folks back in Exeter, particularly Jules Bristow, who so smoothly runs these webinars. And thank you to the audience. Uh, you can watch this, tell your friends, and see you in three months at the next talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.